keep your day job going. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, Glenn. Thanks for that lovely introduction. Uh, and thank you all for being here. It's, uh, it's great to see so many familiar faces uh, and so many people who either helped directly with this project or held my hand at some point in this project. And uh, so it's great to be amongst the, the, uh, the hometown uh, crowd. So uh, thanks for coming out. This book um, is, uh, I, I like to call it, a, uh, a tragedy in three-part harmony. And what I mean by that is, uh, I think the story it tells is a tragedy. Uh, it's, a, it's a tale of, of hope and, and, and despair, I think. Um, and the three-part harmony comes in trying to bring together work and working people, politics and popular culture, and trying to weave together a narrative that, that pulls together all three. And the, this tragic part, I think, is eloquently captured in the epigraph, um, which is by John, John Steinbeck from his, his Grapes of Wrath. So I'd like to begin with that as just sort of a meditation on where we are now uh, in a sort of prophetic way from Steinbeck. And fear the time when the strikes stop, while the great owners live. For every little beaten strike is proof that the step is being taken. And that concern of Steinbeck's uh, animates this book. Uh, what happened to the voices of, of working class dissent, uh, particularly around uh, material concerns? I think we see a lot of cultural dissent, but, but, but what happened to uh, the working class in its modern form and its modern ideal? And that's the, the problem uh, I set out to answer in this, in this history of the 1970s. And the first part of the book is called Hope in the Confusion. And the second part of the book is called Despair in the Order. And while it sounds on the surface like this is a typical decade book, you know, the history of the 50s, the history of the 60s, the history... This, this book is actually about what happens in the middle of that decade. This, this book really revolves around uh, the middle decade period where I think um, history and politics and culture turn. Um, and in the first half of the decade, there's all this sort of tumult and, and, and ferment and the possibility of change and people are talking about things as the ideals and hopes of the 60s sort of move into blue-collar America in the early 70s. Uh, what, we, what, what we think of as the 60s, the ideas of the 60s, really took root in the heartland in the 70s under a very different economic, in a very different economic and political climate. Um, and as I was looking for a way to talk about this change, um, I, I, I wanted to come up with an introduction that wasn't, uh, well, here I am, uh, history professor, and here are my three arguments about this decade, and here's one, here's two, here's three. And as I was trying to come up with a way to talk about this, I, I stumbled across this person, uh, this worker at, at a Ford plant uh, north of Detroit. And his name was Dewey Burton. And the New York Times uh, was interested in figuring out what was going on in the early 70s. There was all this unrest in the shops, and it wasn't just about uh, wages, but it was about working conditions. It was under the, it, 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 it was concerned with the quality of life in the shop as much or more than it was about how much people were being paid. Um, and so they sent a reporter out to this Ford plant, and they, they stumbled across this worker, Dewey Burton, who was on the, uh, about to vote for George Wallace in the 1972 uh, Prime, Michigan primary. Now, George Wallace is a segregationist governor from Alabama who got a lot of uh, populist attention in 1968 and 1972. And so the New York Times sends a reporter out there to find out what's going on with all this blue-collar discontent. And, and they find Dewey, and they end up interviewing him in 1970, 1972, then mid 1974 midterms, twice in 1972, then the 1974 midterms, the 76 race and the 1980 race. Uh, and he goes, he eventually, after um, Wallace is um, crippled by an assassin's bullet in the 1972 primary, uh, 
he, jo he, he bolts from this very sort of conservative populist all the way over to George McGovern, and ends up voting for McGovern in 72, the most left-leaning uh, political <coughs> figure uh, to get a uh, place on the mainstream ticket probably in the 20th century. By the end of the decade, he ends up voting for Ronald Reagan. He becomes the quintessential sort of Reagan Democrat. So I use him as my hook, uh, as my uh, around what I sort of weave this, the story of the introduction. And so, as I mentioned, the first half of the 70s is different than the second half of the 70s. It's sort of post-60s and pre-80s as much as it's a single decade. And in between, um, I thought I'd read a little bit about what Dewey had to say in 1974. Um, 1974 is the year that Michael Harrington wrote a, an essay in Dissent called A Collective Sadness where he just felt something palpably different was happening in the world. Well, Dewey was not an intellectual, uh, but sometimes he sounds like one. Um, and this is a picture of him on the cover, actually. Um, this, is, this, is, this is Dewey and his wife and, and son, David. Um, so let me just, if you'll allow me to read a paragraph. The hope and possibility marbled throughout the confusion of the early part of the decade began to fade into the despair of the new order emerging in the second half. I wanted to be somebody, Dewey Burton declared in 1974. It wasn't the money so much as that I just wanted to have some kind of recognition, you know, to be more tomorrow than I was yesterday. And that's what I was working for. In addition to plugging away down at the four plant, Burton had been trying to start his own custom auto painting business, chipping away slowly at a college degree, and even playing guitar. He drove himself, his wife Ilona said. He'd work all day, study all night, and then take his books with him to work and read on his breaks. Looking a lot more 60s by the mid-70s, with long hair and a black turtleneck, he decided to surrender his hopes for the future in order to concentrate on today, as he put it. It takes so much just to make it, and there's no time for dreams, and no energy for making them come true, he said. And I, I'm not sure anymore that it's ever going to get better, he explained with a poetic fatalism. His creeping despair resonated with what Peter Marin identified in Harper's Magazine in 1975 as a, quote, new world view emerging among us, focused on the self with individual survival as its own good. Burton framed the problem more succinctly. I realized I was killing myself and there wasn't going to be any award, reward for my suicide. Burton saw little hope or opportunity in the emerging reality at mid-decade. Peering out from underneath what he called his despondency, he framed the problem as effectively as any sociologist of the time. Something's happening to people like me, working stiffs as they say. And it isn't just that we have to pay more for this or that or we're having to do without this or make do with a little less of that. It's deep and hard to explain, but, it, but it's more like more and more of us are leaving all of our hopes outside in the rain and coming into the house and just locking the door. You know, just turning the key and click. That's it for what we always thought we could be. And those words come after uh, a series of interviews they did on, on, on sort of his hopes for change and the direction he thought society might be going. But by 74, uh, he was really um, locked into this um, mood, if you will. Um, now let's turn back for a second. Uh, if we look at uh, the earliest part of the, of the book, it is, it's, as I said, there's this hope and the confusion. And one of the points of hope came from the uh, labor movement. Now the labor movement had kind of grown stale and ossified by the, uh, by the late 60s. It had, it had dragged its feet, if not opposed, much of the new social movements and the anti-war movements of the 1960s. But at the same time, there were all these voices of dissent rippling through uh, the labor movement in the early 70s that really suggested the possibility of a new direction for workers. Uh, movements based on, um, on racial inclusion, on quality of work life, on democratizing unions, a whole set of issues. And chapter one opens with the first dashed hope. And I will just, again, Read briefly about this. Clarksville, Pennsylvania, New Year's Eve, 1969. Early in the morning of the last day of the 1960s,